So you're curious as to how to build a single page application. Well, you're in luck because I was going through my old recordings and just happened to stumble across a screen cam that I did explaining core concepts of single page applications. The caveat, I recorded it nearly four years ago. Some of the code I would not want to write today, not the way I write code today, but fundamentally sound explanation of single page application concepts, many of which are the foundations of what we call a progressive web app today. So if you're wanting to know a little bit about how to architect single page applications, this video is for you. Now the application that I'm using in this video was a demo application I built for a book that I wrote about the same time called High Performance Single Page Web Applications. If you'd like to buy the book, it's available on Amazon still for $9.99 and you can click the link in the description below. Now go on and enjoy the video on single page application features. Okay, let's look at how a single page application works. Uh, I'll try to talk about some of the issues that I found over the years. Uh, again, I started actually doing single page applications uh, almost out of necessity about three, three and a half years ago when I first started building mobile web applications. And I quickly realized that the traditional request response model just wasn't going to work uh, to make the kind of stuff that people wanted on the mobile experiences. Um, also, another thing, performance. Performance is a huge deal. Making a site load within one second is always my goal, and then after that, making everything else uh, extremely fast in a natural, fluid transition so that users don't have to wait at all. Um, and that's something that, that should be extremely important to uh, you in your applications. Uh, just so we get this out of the cruft out of the way, I want to just move the focus there we go so now we looked at the responsive nature of this website and I kinda touched on some of the single page features and I want you to pay attention up here at the top to the URL and I'm gonna expand this out so we make sure we see everything if it'll let me there we go um, now the, you notice I've got the hash bang there for the default. And I talked about that kind of being the de facto standard to drive uh, single page application URLs. Now, even if you're, uh, say, building a line of business app that's behind the firewall, I still kind of recommend you use these uh, hash bang URLs to drive stuff, primarily because now you can use the little engine that I've got with the routes and stuff involved, and you've got the deep linking so that your employees can actually uh, bookmark uh, things. And you can kind of control how those URLs. Uh, articulate themselves if you will. So um, just pay attention to that and as I go through the different things I want you to kind of notice what's going on. Uh, first like I said I've got a little flip animation and uh, going on here but uh, probably the, for production I'll take it out just because it doesn't just doesn't seem to work in IE11. It did work in IE10 uh, but they seem to have broken uh, a CSS feature uh, that I've uh, reported. So anyway <laughs> um, there we saw the little flip animation and it went from the home page uh, to a list of movies that are uh, opening this week just the full list instead of the short small list that we had before and notice at the top my URL hash fragment actually changed and I have movies and opening now if you've been like me over the years I loved hacking at URLs especially query string parameters and stuff as a simple way to hack at stuff well you can hack at these too so if we do that, it's going to go in theaters. That's great. Now, that's cool and all. Let's go to the network tab, and let's do a recording of all the traffic that goes back and forth. So let's go back to the home, and let's go to opening movies, and let's go bring up carry. Now let's go back to the network waterfall tab. Okay, I have one request. I just went through the, from the home page 
to a list of opening movies, and then I opened a movie detail page. So that was three page requests in a traditional sense. But as you'll notice, the only content that was actually requested was an update to an image. And that image was, if we look at the response body, was the actual movie poster for the Carrie movie. Uh, for some reason that was not, uh, didn't have the proper uh, caching if we brought it up before, which I think we did. Um, so that ne wasn't necessarily there. But I didn't have to actually go request any data. And the reason is, is because I've already cached that locally and put that into local storage. Now, what I want to do is just kind of keep going through this part. I want to kind of show you how I gear up the SPA part of the application. First, here's the JavaScript for my main movie application module. Now, any modern application, um, there's some there's maturing guidelines, I guess you will, or best practices for building modern JavaScript applications. Generally, that's to have a core application that's extensible. And to do that, I actually reverse engineered Java, jQuery, the way they actually build that library, and found a very useful pattern. And that's how I structure all my JavaScript patterns these days. And the reason is, is because it's easy to understand, to build, as well as extend. It's just dirt simple to extend and uh, to uh, create new objects of it. So when we create a new movie application, I'm actually going to uh, go through and self-instantiate it, and then I'm going to go through and do some initial setup. In this case, I'm making sure that I have um, some features that I need. Okay, so in this case, I've got a reference to Backpack. I've got a data abstraction uh, little library that I wrote, and then my template engine. In this case, I'm using Mustache uh, for my JavaScript templates. And Mustache allows you to pre-compile templates, so I go, through, go ahead and just pre-compile those templates. And then I set up some other things. Here's where I set up Toolbar. Here's where I set up some uh, navigation touching features for the hamburger nav and the main nav. And um, here's where I uh, add a global resize event. I actually have a little mechanism I put in play where you can actually inject uh, methods or callback methods that need to get called when the views resize based on the individual view. Um, and that's just kind of an example of something you can do. I actually use um, some of the dynamic features of JavaScript called associative array techniques to actually make this happen here. And uh, here's where I want to uh, wire up the back, the back button, the little left arrow at the top left corner, and then I re return a reference to the new instance that we created up here at the top. So now that everything's initialized the way we want, uh, we've got uh, access to that. Now to kick it all off, I actually use uh, a, what I call a bootstrapping technique, and this is one of the last JavaScript, or should be the last JavaScript file uh, in your chain of JavaScript files. And what that's going to do, it's going to create me a new instance of Backpack, my little data uh, library, and then I'm going to pass in or those references uh, to set up in my movie application and got those all set up. Then I'm actually going to create a new instance of my SPA and that's going to be uh, set up and I'm passing in uh, some parameters for that as well to set up. Now to actually show you how I extend the uh, core application each view has its own set of methods and I tend to put those methods into a dedicated file uh, a, again, it's easier to, to organize and find. Uh, when you're developing, you don't step on each other's toes so easily. You don't get these giant JavaScript files that, for development, are just hard to maintain and manage. Here's where I'm actually loading or the, the initial load method for my home view. And that's going to go through. It's going to set up some stuff. It's going to go grab the data. I've got some. These methods are actually defined in the API file. But notice I'm using um, a reference to that which is a local variable of this. And the, the reason why you want to do that in JavaScript is because you gotta kinda of keep track of this, the this context. Because inside of this little callback method here, um, the this is not gonna be necessarily the same as the this outside that method um, call. So what you do is you create a local variable and then you actually can reference it inside of this method. Um, and I know I'm using this and that a lot. Uh, just uh, try to keep track uh, and trust me on this. So then now when I use that, it's actually going to reference the variable that that I have defined up here. And then I have a merge data method, which is a, a general method that I have to actually uh, merge data that comes back in JSON format 
with a particular uh, template, mustache template that I have defined, and then once that content is actually generated by the templating engine to uh, append that or add it uh, at the right place, which I have a uh, class here that I'm going to actually use as my anchor to put my movie grids in there. And as you've seen actually using the application, uh, that all happens extremely fast. So I do the same thing here. It's just opening the movies and it's got uh, you know the, the callbacks here. Um, here is where I'm actually setting up the resize event for this particular page and I want to make sure that panorama width is constantly uh, set to the, the right size. There are some uh, JavaScript things that I'm doing to uh, set the styles for the actual width and stuff and so as we do make it responsive those kind of do need to be called as the screen size adjust uh, and you want to kind of make sure you're not constantly running through the entire logic stream every single time it, it resizes so you, it's a little um, uh, detail oriented as far as uh, making it work correctly. So, and this is the actual method here. And as you can look at the code later on, and you can see these methods are, are available to you. Um, so, this is, I'm going to wrap those in a self executing anonymous function so it keeps it, make sure it's out of the global namespace, which is good. Um, but for every individual view, I make a different JavaScript file to have its method stored and they're all extended by doing this. The movie app itself is called movie app and that's going to actually be a member at the global point. That's the only variable at the global that I'm actually creating called, it is called movie app and that's the one I'm going to make new. Anything else is, is a member of that particular um, object. Now, if you actually go back and look at the, the main core note module, um, I'm aliasing the prototype to fn, and that's something that the jQuery uh, module actually does. And I found it to be actually be useful because it's a shorthand notation, and it's easy to kind of uh, see and read. Um, and then I'm just extending that prototype to the load movies view. And you want to extend the prototype and ex instead of extending at the main object level because then as you new up new instances these things just carry along with it and that's what you really want it's better for performance memory etc and then so all these methods now are just part of that object they're just extended off because JavaScript is dynamic you can add and remove uh, members uh, as you need them now one of the things I actually do is here's I've got all my little data calls to make the Ajax calls I've made abstraction methods for each one of those because I reused a lot of the code over and over again. I just wanted to make it a little easier to use. Now, one thing you may be noticing, I don't have jQuery in my application. I have kind of don't use jQuery unless a customer requires me to use jQuery because it just can't meet my performance guidelines, um, especially in the mobile context. And I, I found that it was actually not that hard to write vanilla JavaScript, meaning that I actually talk to the native APIs directly. So think about it this way. If you didn't have to use C Sharp and you could, you found out that it was actually pretty easy to use C to call the Win32 API, you could make some extremely fast native Windows applications. Uh, not to say that C Sharp applications aren't fast, but you could actually make measurably fast and much smaller, tighter uh, applications as well. And that's effectively what I'm doing here. So I don't have a, a, J, a an Ajax library per se, although it's not that hard to kind of write it up yourself. Um, I did find a nice little uh, Ajax library called Request uh, on microjs.com, which has a list of a lot of little small, uh, tiny, uh, fast, uh, I don't want to say fast is qualitative, but they tend to be fast, uh, libraries to accomplish the things you need. You don't necessarily need a full library like Angular or jQuery or something like that that's a uh, everything for everybody kind of library because um, generally you only need a small portion of that library to actually accomplish what you need and these little micro libraries are great for that. And I found the request is pretty easy to use. It actually implements the same interface that jQuery does except it's just a lot smaller and tends to be a little bit faster. Uh, so that's kind of why I went with that. Now, I actually wrote a, an abstraction library over top of that. And the reason why I did that is because I use a technique to store data in local storage. And we'll look at that here in a second. It's easier to visualize in Chrome, but I want to walk you through the code first. And again, I'm making a module just like I showed you before. And in this, we're ultimately going to do what we call an Ajax pre-filter. Now, this comes from jQuery. The, re the place I got uh, this particular methodology here um, was 
there is an Ajax pre-filter available on GitHub. And I think I'm trying to think of the guy's name. James Pierce, I think, is the guy who made it. Anyway, um, and what you're doing is you're kind of injecting yourself into the Ajax pipeline of the library. And in this case, I'm wanting to see if the data already exists in local storage. If not, then I'm going to ultimately make the Ajax request. I'm going to store the result in local storage with a time to live value as well so that I can kind of determine when that data becomes stale so I don't have data hanging around uh, that's no longer valid anymore. Now that could be a minute in your case, it could be a month or a year. Um, it depends on your data and your culture. Um, so you kind of need to think accordingly. I've set it up so that you can define how long something lives. So in the case of a movie, a movie detail doesn't really ever change. It comes back from Rotten Tomatoes. So in theory, I could probably set that out to a month or two before that becomes stale. But a list of movies that are opening next week, that changes every week. So I need to make sure that that um, is timed so that it, it updates itself accordingly. Now, um, uh, top box office obviously changes every week. Generally, those change on Thursdays with movies, but I can't necessarily guarantee that's what's going to be the case. So I think what I've done is I've actually set it up to be to keep those lists for a day and uh, typically try to keep the, the movie details uh, a little bit longer because those tend not to change very much at all. Now, like I said, in general, you get five megabytes of storage in local storage. Um, older mobile devices, it may be a meg or two, uh, but generally those devices, they just aren't really used for uh, heavy browsing, if you will. Uh, I don't want to sound prejudiced or anything, but most of the time, what they do is um, users of those phones, they don't really do uh, a lot of browsing or anything. They generally talk on the phone and send text messages and check Facebook. Um, but that's... Uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, now, with Windows uh, 8 and Internet Explorer 10 and 11, uh, what I've read and I haven't totally verified is you can get up to 50 megs of storage in local storage. So I hope you enjoyed that video on single page application architecture and principles. Again, I recorded the video sometime in the 2013 timeframe. However, many of those principles still hold true today and they are the foundation for progressive web apps. And honestly, some of what the Google Chrome team calls the purple pattern, as well as the rail pattern. So hopefully you've been able to learn a little bit, maybe apply that to your development process, and maybe it'll make your applications better. If you want to know more about making great web applications, especially progressive web apps and service workers, you want to subscribe to this channel. You can do it by hitting this, the button over here or in a button down below.